Welcome to the Museum of Making Music in Carlsbad, California. I'm Tom Wilson for Pace TV. This museum's galleries cover the various decades in music from the 1890s to the present. Have you ever fantasized about being a singer or a rock star or playing a musical instrument? Well, come on inside with me and your dreams just might come true. Well, hello, Carolyn. We're hello. here with Carolyn Grant, the director of the Museum of Making Music. And we're here in the first gallery, which is the one that deals with the early part of making music. What, what brought the museum about and, and how would you characterize the museum of making music? Music making and the making of musical instruments is as old as humankind. Um, but our museum is unique in that we're dropping in on history at a specific time period. We're dropping in on history at beginning of the last century, um, right around 1900. And what this museum celebrates and explores is the accomplishments and impact of the music products industry. And many people ask, well, what is a music products industry? Well, that is the industry made up of people who make, sell, and use musical instruments. And it is an industry that came into being right around the turn of the last century. Carolyn, there's a lot of instruments here, but it's not about having a Stradivarius or the most unique instrument here. What is it that the museum does that's a little bit different from other, it's not just a place for famous old dusty instruments for people to look at. Well, we are a very active museum, and we look at a side of history that not everyone knows. We're really kind of a, the backstory to how we get access to musical instruments, how instruments are made, how they're distributed, and how we, how we gain access to them, and then what we do with them. Um, we look at perhaps some of the unsung heroes uh, in, the, in the musical world, and those are the people that actually make the instruments, design the instruments, listen to the needs of musicians, create new instruments, um, and then get them into our hands. Well, we're here in the first gallery where the Industrial Revolution started. And this is kind of a transition period from when we had handcrafted instruments that were made by individual masters to then all these companies and industrial companies then making instruments for the masses. So let's go take a look and see what some of those instruments were. We're here with these lovely brass instruments, I guess, but they're coated with silver. Um, we seem to have two different instruments here, and one of these is called a sousaphone. Now, John Philip Sousa was very popular back in his time. He was definitely an innovator, and, but he didn't make instruments, but he had a request to change the instrument. How did all that come about? Well, John Philip Sousa was a very, very important band leader of his time, and he had a specific request. He needed an instrument where the bell would project differently from what was available. Instead of projecting straight out, he wanted the bell of his instrument to project upwards or forward. So he went to a manufacturer and requested this change, and his innovation really solidified what we now call a sousaphone. Its precursor was a helicon, but you see now the sousaphone has this bell that goes up, or as you see in many football games, it has the bell forward. Here we go from the sousaphone here to a little bit different technology. Uh, in getting music out to the masses, we have the recording industry starting with Edison and Bell and their inventions. Um, how did that affect music and, and getting it out to the people? Well, if you can imagine a time where the only way you could hear music was if you heard it live or if you yourself played it. Um, it. It was a completely different period in music making history and this absolutely rev revolutionized not only the way we can learn music but the way the types of music that we have access to. Before the phonograph we wouldn't be able to hear uh, music that was played in certain places, for example. We could all of a sudden have access to uh, popular tunes, uh, early jazz, ragtime, uh, uh, classical tunes, etc. So it absolutely revolutionized uh, the, way we, the way we got access to music. So you had something besides the Star Spangled Banner, something that maybe the local band might play at an event. 
you've now got music coming from, from New York, from California, from all kinds of places by all different people that people are getting exposed to. This instrument here, which is, we all know, the player piano, which was extraordinarily popular at the turn of the last century. Um, it was as popular as the bicycle um, in the 1900s, early 1900s. And although it's a different type of recording mechanism, it's really considering musical notes as data, which we know mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> later precursor on. Precursor to our computer. Absolutely. This is an instrument that has a very long, rich history in, in, in Europe as well, but that came across the ocean with the waves of, of immigration um, uh, over the, in the 1800s. And um, it came to the United States. It was wildly popular. There were touring uh, orchest mandolin orchestras, mandolins of different sizes. Um, it was very, very popular. And then um, a US company, uh, Gibson, as many, many people will know. I've heard that name. <laughs> um, well, they took on the mandolin um, as a project. Um, and kind of changed it a little bit. And you'll see that this instrument yeah. has, has a flatter back, Close probably a little bit more comfortable for a musician. It's also um, just, this one it happens to be uh, two, two pieces of wood as opposed to all of these ribs of right. wood back there. Um, it also has a carved top. It has F holes similar to the violin family instruments. And um, it also had a very vibrant tone. Um, so Gibson was working on creating a uh, high quality, elegant instrument, um, but also uh, it became very popular for other reasons as well. Um, and that is um, Gibson had um, tremendously uh, good marketing and so they had teachers that would sell the instruments, they created mandolin orchestras all across the United States, and this instrument became uh, even more popular than it was um, when, it just, when, it, when it had come over with the immigrants. Well, with American immigration, they had a little bit different name for this mandolin. It actually um, was referencing a beetle that happened to be devastating the crops. Uh, in the Midwest. Mm -hmm. So this mandolin is often referred to as a potato bug mandolin ah, because okay. of its shape and because of its markings. But it was also a marketing technique to get people to turn away from the old school and, and adopt something new. The new American wonderful version of the mandolin. That's right. And it is a wonderful version of the mandolin because as many people know, this instrument became synonymous with bluegrass. It's fascinating to see how these changes in, in genres and changes in musical tastes also impact musical instruments. Uh, just a couple of examples here. This is a four-string banjo, and um, the banjo prior to this had five strings and was played in, in different styles of music, but for Dixieland jazz and for small group jazz, uh, more chords were needed to be played on this instrument and more rhythmic and, and um, so the, 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 um, the instrument itself changed from five strings to four strings. So that's one example. Um, another uh, great instrument development at this time was the development of the drum kit. We might not think that um, uh, before you know, the 20th century, uh, many drummers uh, weren't necessarily sitting down. Um, there's a development of the drum pedal that enabled a drummer to sit down uh, and why the drummer needed to sit down was because they were needed to play more intricate uh, rhythms. The rhythms that were being used in jazz uh, were much more syncopated, there was improvisation, um, so a musician needed to be able to play very intricate rhythms, it needed um, feet, hands, everything to, to play those rhythms. This is a beautiful example of, a, of an early drum kit um, you can begin to see how our modern day drum kit um, evolved and this was uh, an early example of that. Notice that there's um, a beautiful bass drum here. Um, a, a, a wonderful study is to look at how instruments are not only useful but beautiful. If you notice the scene that is painted on the 
the um, head of this drum. It's a beautiful cabin scene with a lake and some snow. I just think that's fabulous. Another interesting um, aspect to this particular instrument is that you'll notice a chord coming out down there. And that is because inside this drum, there was a light bulb. And the light bulb uh, was not in there to light up the drum head. It was actually in there to keep the drum tuned in cold weather. Because remember, at this time period, they were still um, uh, animal skin heads. Um, the, the plastic or synthetic drum head had not yet been developed. So that was a necessity of the musician. Well, Carol, we're getting towards the end of the gallery here. And I see we have a theremin. <laughs> This was sort of a precursor to electronic instruments that kind of kept this, this whole area in the 20s. Electricity really started to creep into instruments, didn't it? Sure. It was at this time that it was realized that electricity makes music. And um, the theremin is a great example of something that eventually turned into synthesizer technology as okay. we know it today. Uh, but the theremin itself was invented by a Russian scientist who was developing surveillance technology. And um, so this instrument that he created actually works on inter works by interrupting radio frequencies. Mm. So it's one of the few instruments, especially at that time, that can be played without actually touching it. Because one of the antenna, there's two antenna, and one is for volume and one is for pitch. By moving your hands, closer and further away mm -hmm. from these antenna, it would change. There were actually concerts and things like that that they did oh. with this instrument. Oh yes, it was actually considered a serious instrument. There was a player by the name of Clara Rockmore who could play the most intricate classical pieces, Tchaikovsky, on the theremin, which is a very, very difficult instrument to play. Well, some of the other instruments that we have here, um, radio kind of started to come into its own at this time, and another way to get the music out to the masses. And also the instruments went along with that. You were getting more dance clubs and things like that. They didn't have public address systems a whole lot in those days, so they wanted to make the music louder. And one of the ways they did that was the resonator guitar. Yes, well volume is a major theme in music making and increasing the volume became very important. Uh, as you said, venues are getting larger, bands are getting larger, and the guitar uh, needed to be heard. Uh, guitar banjos were falling out of favor and guitars were being picked up as, as more of the instrument to be played in bands. So the, the volume on guitars, many people were experimenting. Um, there are a, a variety of different different guitars right now, and as you mentioned, the um, the resonator guitar. You've got a tricone. This has three different resonator cones inside, so it's making volume uh, thanks to the resonator as opposed to vibrating wood on the head. An archtop guitar, a Martin guitar is getting bigger, adding frets onto the neck. So it's an exciting time. Carolyn, we're here in the next gallery, the 1930s and 40s. And that's a time where there's all kinds of things going on, all kinds of changes. Radio is getting bigger and everybody's got one. We've also got the depression. So that's not a real happy time, but people are wanting to dance, be in clubs. The manufacturers want to get instruments and music out to people. So they did some kind of different things to do that, didn't they? Well, yes. Um, you know, out of uh, hardship comes a lot of creativity, mm -hmm. and they certainly were creative. I mean, we can just see here, you know, why would we have a toaster and a coffee maker in a musical instrument museum? Well, that is just to show that, you know, retailers uh, uh, would take items, uh, household items such as these, uh, in trade. Accordions were sold door to door, a very, very vibrant um, hmm. um, um, program of door to door yeah. sales of accordions. Records are getting more popular and that kind of thing. We also have the big bands coming ah. into play there. So yeah. why don't we take a look at some of those instruments right now. Great. Okay, and we're here in the 30s and the 40s. And this is just a, a great example of big band music and the instruments that were played at that day. And a lot of these instruments came from a classical background, but they sure changed a lot when the big bands picked them up. A saxophone has a fascinating story. I mean, it's a very recent invention. I mean, it, it came 
to be in the 1800s. It was invented by a Belgian by the name of Adolf Sachs. So many things in the music products industry that carry the name of their inventor or the kind of but anyway, um, so Adolf Sachs invented the saxophone, but originally it was for use in classical music, and many classical composers um, created pieces uh, specifically for the saxophone. But then, because of the sound, the timbre, the sound of the saxophone, and its very um, almost voice-like qualities, mm -hmm. um, it found a home in jazz. I mean, there was a great cr saxophone craze in the in the 20s, but when it hit the big band era, wow, it found a home. I mean, look, front and center in, in the big band. And it has defined defined us as a, as a musical culture. I mean, you can't imagine music today without the sound of a saxophone in there somewhere. Well, and that goes with World War II mm -hmm. came into uh, America at that time. The drum kit there also being more center stage um, as part of the jazz band mm -hmm. and keeping the beat and, and people dancing and, and just doing that all night long. No video games back then, so <laughs> everybody was dancing. And oddly enough, we carried that entertainment on to the GIs and World War II, and let's take a look at this little Steinway piano over here. Um, this particular piano is called a Steinway GI piano. It was made specifically to be sent over to the troops during World War II. They made them in this olive drab, and they also made them in blue, marine blue, mm -hmm. navy blue. Um, and not very many of them survived for obvious reasons, but there were a few that never got shipped over, mm -hmm. and, and we have one of the very few. Um, you know, music making during wartime, I and mean, we hear it today, you know, uh, about the, the power of music making mm -hmm. uh, in the field, right. um, and, and uh, you know, it. It, it, it has always been an uh, integral part of wartime. Um, so this is symbolic of that. Um, there's a wonderful um, depiction of soldiers in the field playing guitars, ukulele, uh, piano. Um, it's just a, a wonderful story and one that, that, that deserves exploration. That's definitely part of our history. Apparently we went from the 40s, now we're into the 50s and the 60s. And the electric guitar is just gotten invented and we're just experimenting with that in the 40s and that got a big boost when Elvis got a hold of it and then we also went from radio which is still very popular to television which now comes into the, <laughs> the equation with music and development. In the 60s with the advent of the Beatles um, it was a it the effect of the Beatles rippled out for many many years and of course we're still feeling it but um, you know, during this time period in the 50s, the teenager became um, became a very important part of society. They were a big demographic. They were they? a big demographic. And um, with the baby boom and, and, I mean, teenagers were now somebody to market to, you know. And uh, with the advent of the Beatles and, and the early rock and roll, um, everybody wanted to play in a garage band. So the profile of the music products world changed drastically. We have a Wurlitzer piano here. What can you tell me about this? Well, we're stepping into a whole different side of our musical story and walk through time. And this is, has to do with keyboards. Now, we're in the 50s and 60s now. This instrument dates from the 50s. Um, it looks like a piano, but is it a piano? It doesn't have strings anymore, and it doesn't have a soundboard. Um, it makes its music electronically. Um, and because of the way it is made, you know, hitting metal reeds and translating those, those, those um, hitting the metal reed and translating that into electronic signals, it has a signature sound. And so now the music that is coming out during this time period, you can specifically hear the sounds of the Wurlitzer piano. Well, Carolyn, we're here in the last gallery. And uh, that's the one that's really about all today, and about really where this museum kind of comes together, the digital technology that allows people to do so many things with just one instrument now. Um, the keyboards, boy, they sure evolved from what we were just looking at a few minutes ago. Um, the advent of, of synthesizers, I mean, we started with this kind of electromechanical technology, mm -hmm. which moved into analog technology, which now is in digital technology, the advent of MIDI, which enables um, uh, computers and keyboards to talk to one another. I mean, you name it, we can do it today. Well, and computers are instruments now. 
Yes, well, that's one question that we that we start to ask ourselves now that, that in this last gallery is what defines a musical instrument. Right. But one thing that we are seeing is that, um, along with this desire to continuously uh, innovate, mm -hmm. continuously find new sounds, new ways to make music, new messages that we want to want to give out through music, there is also another. Um, side to that, and that is a great honoring of tradition. Mm -hmm. um, creating um, violins, violas, uh, you know, stringed instruments, guitars, along the lines of the great makers of the past. We've got all these modern advances in this section of the museum. Mm -hmm. You still have the coming together of the old from the first guy we came into, those instruments, those fine pieces oh, of yes. art almost that those are, are merging into that sound as well. Like those are being incorporated Absolutely. with the digital and with the computer technology. Yeah, it really comes down to personal preference. What do you, as a human being, want to do in music? Do you want to play um, a bullback mandolin that originated in Europe? That's your sound, that's what you play. There's a mandolin orchestra, wonderful mandolin orchestras here locally. Um, that that have some of the bullback mandolins, some of the some of the flatback mandolins. Um, there are um, ukuleles. I mean, ukuleles come originally from Portugal through Hawaii here to the United States. There's a huge ukulele craze these days. A little traditional uh, acoustic instrument, mm -hmm. but there are also electric ukuleles. Bass yeah. ukuleles, effects pedals on ukuleles. I mean, you can get a, a ukulele <laughs> in your little keyboard. If you want. Or you can get a little ukulele, ukulele sound in your keyboard. Absolutely. Well, we want everybody who comes to this museum to leave having at least touched an instrument. You wouldn't believe the the number of people that come here that are afraid to touch an instrument. Um, and so we have instruments. Um, throughout the museum that people can pick up, play, experiment with, and if you're shy and, and don't want people to hear what you're doing, we have earphones as well. Uh, in every, for every single instrument except for uh, the, the uh, acoustic guitars, mandolins, mm -hmm. and ukuleles. So on the, on the keyboards, the computers and stuff, you can make your own music. Yeah. Good or bad, whatever it is, it doesn't matter. It's, it's getting your hands dirty musically and, right. and getting into it. You'll, I think you'll be surprised when you touch an instrument if you're if you're not familiar with instruments and you come in here and you try a variety of, of string or keyboard uh, or percussion instruments. I think you'll be surprised to find that you'll be com really comfortable with one of them um, because we believe here at the museum that everybody resonates to a particular instrument. You just might not have discovered it yet. There's a little bit of music in everybody. It just has to come out and be discovered. Think about taking lessons or something. Kind of like getting a car. You can do a little test drive here at the museum. See if it's a banjo or a guitar or whatever it is that uh, may interest you. Whatever sound it is that you love, you can actually make yourself. And we also have stations here at the museum where you can come in and take a mini lesson. So you can learn three chords on a, on a, on a keyboard, three chords on a guitar, you can learn some, some uh, drum riffs. Um, you, can, you can leave having made music. We have a lot of programs. We are so excited about music making and, and, and the importance of it in our lives that we do, do, do as much as we can to get people involved in it. For example, we, we bring uh, student tours here to the museum. We've got interactive field trips. They're not quiet. They're, they're um, quite musical. <laughs> There's a drum circle, sometimes a ukulele circle, um, lots of uh, laughing and, and uh, answering questions and such, exploring musical instruments. Um, we also have an in-school program. We've adopted a school and uh, in, uh, we expose every single child in that school to weekly music lessons as well as um, uh, assemblies and uh, getting hands-on with as many instruments as we possibly can expose them to. Um, and then we also have the other side of the spectrum. We do um, an adult band and an adult orchestra and these are programs for adults that um, either played a musical instrument early on or never played an instrument at all and want to learn. Um, so we've got about um, 90 people in our band and about 50 people in our orchestra, so those are going strong. Uh, we also um, 
of course, are uh, committed to presenting wonderful music in a, in a concert setting. So we do uh, intimate concerts um, with very, uh, with professional musicians. We've got all sorts of concert series. Um, and we do concert series in addition to all of our special exhibitions. I mean, one thing that's, that's unique to our museum is that we're a museum about something active. We're a museum about the process, about, about you know, something that has to be done in order, you know, musical instruments are, are, are the beginning. Um, what comes out of them and what comes out of the musician itself is, is the rest of the story. But we hope you've enjoyed your tour at the Museum of Making Music. And we thank Carolyn Grant and the staff at the Museum of Making Music for making it all happen. Carolyn, I want to thank you for having us out here and showing us all these wonderful instruments and things that you have here. Well, it's our sincere pleasure. All right. So come on down and bring the family to experience some great musical history, some musical instruments, and interactive music making, as well as concerts and other features. The latest update can be found on the museum website, all the activities. If you want to donate, if you want to volunteer, you can check out the website, museumofmakingmusic.org.org. I'm Tom Wilson for Pace TV. Thanks for watching. United States. Founded in 1978, we've been around for over 30 years. We are a nonprofit corporation whose membership consists of senior volunteers aged 50 and over. Our members have produced and presented over 900 award-winning shows of topical interest to the San Diego community. These shows air each week on 